tent, which uh, has a beautiful soundtrack of birds. It's away from all the crazy crowds. You're in just the right place for a wonderful panel that we're really excited to be hosting. If I could just ask everybody to turn your cell phones off. I know we keep repeating this, but it really is a sign of respect for our authors who will be sharing with us their thoughts today. So please turn them to silent. And if you do have a really urgent conversation, because that does happen, if you just take it outside, that'd be very kind. So, I guess it, it's also worth noting because, um, you know, we have, we have very, we've, we've had a lot of very packed sessions in here, that if you just wouldn't mind giving up your seat, if you do see someone coming in who's in need of a seat, um, who's elderly or in need, and please don't leave any bags unattended because that can cause a bit of a security risk. Um, but without further ado, I think that's enough housekeeping. We can get on with the lovely panel. So, welcome to We That Are Young. And we're very, very pleased to have with us today Arushi Reina and Zuni Chopra. And they'll be in conversation with Veena Benugopal, who is the author of two books, one called The Mother-in-Law, which sounds fabulous, and Would You Like Some Bread With That Book, which is a collection of essays on books and reading. Uh, she's also the editor of Briefcase, which is a mobile news app for the Hindu. And she also writes extensively on gender issues and books. So please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage our panelists for this session today, and please enjoy. Uh, good afternoon, welcome to We That Are Young. Um, although uh, I think even if I add up the ages of my panelists, uh, I'd still be older than that, so maybe we should change that to you who are young instead. Um, so on my right, uh, Zuni Chopra, a uh, young author of um, uh, two uh, mainstream works, one a book called The House That Spoke, and um, also The Island of the Day Before. And uh, Arushi Reiner at the extreme right, uh, who wrote When Morning Comes, uh, a book about four young adults uh, set in South Africa in the 1970s. So we'll um, jump into the session and then maybe if we have time towards the end before the questions, uh, we will do a couple of short readings. Uh, let me begin with you, Arushi. Uh, your book, When Morning Comes, is an account of the lead up to the Soweto uprising in 1976, uh, when some 20,000 students marched in protest against the oppression uh, of blacks in the education policies of the country. Um, you write the story through four main characters and the churns in their lives during the time. Uh, how did you sort of imagine the lives of young people set in a story that happened well before you were born? Uh, I think one of the most useful ways to, for me to navigate uh, yeah, a time or a place that I didn't know, uh, one of my author friends said this to me was, when you're building a world, there's always something from your world that carries over to that world. So while it was the 70s, I did grow up in Joburg, and uh, what I did have was a lens on how 50-year-olds were across race lines and what my own life was compared to others. So I think what was the most vivid in the book are things that I knew very intimately. Um, the different spaces in the book are spaces I know intimately, but I didn't know uh, the 70s. So I worked from what I knew, started there and built it out, and then the stuff I didn't know was then safer or easier because at least I had a kernel that was true. But uh, why did you decide on a historical uh, uh, fiction and, and not a, a, a story set in more contemporary times, which I presume might be easier? Well, I was trying to avoid that question because I didn't decide. Um, it sort of just happened. Um, I actually told myself from a very, very early age that I will never write a historical fiction because it's too much work. You have to research and you have to deal with facts. Um, and I actually wished I could have been a fantasy writer. Um, but that didn't work out. And I, I just started with an image. And the image was this jazz singer. Uh, and I saw a picture on the floor when I was in downtown Joburg. And this jazz singer, fully formed character, popped into my head. And her name was Zanele, and she was a jazz singer, but she couldn't sing very well. So I actually realized 
a year later that this was actually in the past. And there was actually a bigger, deeper, you know, background and backdrop to the story, but it was all by accident. So one of the interesting questions that I heard in a session yesterday, which began with, why do you write? And I want to post that to you, Zuni, especially because uh, I want to know, A, why do you write? And how did you start writing so young? When, how old were you when you first sort of thought, oh, this is uh, really something that I think I want to do? Um, well, I started writing when I was about six, but again, completely by accident, because I used to get, I don't know how many of you guys have bought them, but those Playmobil figures, and I used to collect a bunch of those, and I used to, I didn't really like the Lego ones as much, because I didn't care about the actual building of it, I just cared about the making of the story, so that was the main reason that I kind of got into telling stories and all of those things, and I would spend, I mean, I would spend hours building them, but I would spend hours playing with them as, as well. And that was kind of the beginning of stories, and I would start writing like little poems and things and just stuff that rhymed because I thought it was fun. But I only knew that I actually really wanted to do this seriously when I started writing my novel, because I think that you don't know that you want to do something until you've really worked hard at it. Because before that, it was something that I enjoyed, but nothing more than that. And then when I actually really worked at this, I was like, oh my god, this is tough, and it kind of sucks, but it's kind of amazing. And I think that's when I really realized that it was something I wanted to do seriously and you know, more than a hobby. But what made you work at it? I mean, because that wasn't part of your school work, so this is something no, that you were doing not. for yourself. And, yeah. and what kept you at it? I think just the fact that, I think when the story had a purpose for being told was when it became really important for me to finish it. Um, because at first in the story, the house that spoke wasn't set, it was set in London because it was based on a house that a friend had told me about that was in London. But then when I moved it to, to Kashmir, suddenly it had a whole reason for being told, you know, to tell the real story of Kashmir the way that I saw it. And I guess that's what really kept me working at it, even when I was like, this is never going to work. So I guess, yeah. And from when I was re really young, I've got no idea. I don't even remember. I mean, my earliest memory is like, just, I don't even know why I wrote. It was just something fun to do. And I just thought it was like, it never occurred to me that this wasn't something every other kid did. And, and just to sort of uh, take it a full circle, uh, are you planning on, on studying to be a writer or is that going to be the thing that you do alongside something else? I am planning on studying. I'm at university. Um, I'm going to university in September, actually, um, which is really exciting. And I'm planning to do courses in liberal arts. And, um, you know, there's a really amazing, like, a fiction and <coughs> a film track at university that I want to try and a hundred different things. But that's also why I want to go to university because it affords me the chance to do 800 different things. Uh, Arushi, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the process that you followed in writing the book, especially in weaving the f facts of, uh, weaving historical facts through your fiction. Uh, what, how, what is your process for that? At, at what time, I mean, at what sort of, part of the plot do you think that let me bring in a little bit of historical context and that what part is it just about the characters and, and, and their sort of stories? Uh, so I learned the hard way that you can't really research efficiently. Like you can't find optimally the facts you want for the novel. Um, in my day job, that's what I did for my job was find as few facts as I needed to BS my way to the next meeting. And I did that very well. Um, but in writing, it doesn't work quite that way. And so um, when I realized the jazz singer belonged to the 70s, I was like, oh dear, research. And I would read a bunch of books and feel like hours passed, days passed, months passed, and nothing happened. Like no light bulb happened. And one of the most useful things I was told was sometimes you just need to stop with the research, go back into the writing, and then the writing will tell you what research you need to do. So um, then I started writing. And then the facts that I thought were super useless in the books I read were the ones that suddenly leapt onto the page. Um, and again and again that happened, all the facts that I actually took notes of and knew where the books came from were garbage. So I think uh, the process is really um, write, read a bit of a foundation, read you know, a couple books, um, you know, spend some time, spend a couple months, then go into the writing. Then, then you'll always, after that, you're always bridging into those two worlds, and it's a very haphazard process after that, but it, it gets you to the right output. And how long did, did it take, the, the whole process of both researching and writing the book? I think I started in uh, 2013, and I had my first, I had the draft out, um, I would say end of 2014, so around a year and a half, two years. 
Zuni, in your book, The House That Spoke, uh, it is also set in a conflict zone. But you sort of managed to keep uh, most of the conflict outside of the book. I mean, you, kn you know that there is conflict outside, but it doesn't really sort of seep into the plot of the book. Um, was that a difficult choice because uh, conflict does sort of offer instant drama? It does, but I guess it wasn't really a difficult choice because I always knew that this wasn't going to be a story about the conflict because I just feel like I'm not even qualified to write a book about that. Um, so it was always going to be a story of this young girl in Kashmir and the whole point was to show people that there can be stories in Kashmir that aren't about the conflict. That it's a whole world beyond what people see. Because whenever you say Kashmir, people are just like, oh, that's like a complete war zone. But well, yeah, but there's more to it than <coughs> that. And that's, so it wasn't really a difficult decision because that's what the book was at the heart and that's what it had always been. Um, when, when writing for a young adult audience, uh, uh, you are not only competing with other books, but now you're also competing with Netflix and the mobile phone and Instagram and all of that. In your assessment as writers who sort of uh, speak to that demographic, what are the hooks to a reader's mind? What, how do you keep them interested in, in, in a longer format especially and a non-visual one? I mean, I can, we, we, I'll have both of you answer yeah. this question. Well, I mean, I love Netflix, so I feel like I can't say anything against it. But I guess they're just completely different things. I mean, if somebody loves to read, then I don't think Netflix is going to stop them from reading. But again, like I said, I feel like really hypocritical saying this because literally just yesterday, I, I had another session and I came back and my mom was like, don't start watching Netflix. You, you're so smart and you fill your mind with such garbage. And I was like, okay. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess they're very different things in my mind. Like, it never occurred to me that that would be a problem, that somebody who loves reading would stop because of Netflix. No, the question was not stop, but how do you sort of keep, keep them, them hooked? Yeah. I guess it's, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't thought about it. I just sort of tell the story that I want to tell, and I feel like as long as I, as an author, am interested in telling it, then readers will be interested in seeing what happens at the end. But if I get bored of it, then there's no way you can expect the reader not to. Arishi, do you want to take a stab at this? Well, when I, so... Um, don't try this at home, but the other day I opened my diary when I was 16 or 15 or 13 that I have like sporadic diaries and you know I thought look like I should have been able to string a decent sentence together that was like okay I ended up like writing a little bit for my living and it was very badly written But I did find a gem where it was like straight up me telling my diary that I'm gonna write and be famous like, that I was going to write a novel and be famous. Guys, spoiler alert, you don't get famous. <laughs> um, but I, I, that, yeah, and I don't want to be famous, actually. I'm least interested in that. Whenever I meet famous people, I'm like, what an awful life you have. Um, but what was interesting is that idea of being hooked, because when I started writing at 16, I wasn't as successful as her. I was not published until very late, much later. But I, I was driven by this need to be heard and be seen and hook people. And um, I think the best lesson is, you got to that faster, is you kind of have to let the story happen. However, what I will say is that when you look at all this media, because I, you know, I go, in, go into high schools, first of all, they think I'm a high school student, um, which I am not. Um, and then two, they sort of um, are on their phones or they're doing something else. And I just let them do whatever they're going to do. Because I know when I was 16, I was the one in the back row being like, ugh, like, please stop, old lady. Like, you know, so I'm okay with, you know, them like not taking me seriously. But I think the hook is um, it's about saying something. Um, I think, especially for young people, is young, quote unquote, young people is they don't like people being fake. So I will go in there and I'll say something really uncomfortable that they know and I know. And in my books, I have moments of doing that. And I don't do it intentionally, but that for me is the hook. Because there's nothing that Netflix and all these other things can do, I mean, barring like a comedy routine, where another human who you're like, oh, she's lecturing me, looks you in the eye and says, I see that truth, I'm going to voice it, and I'm going to agree with you. And it's uncomfortable, but we need to say it. Um, and it can be political, it can be human. And I think sometimes books take a while to get there, but if you're able to hook that and there's this humanity behind it, it doesn't matter what, hu what media you use. You're, then, then you connect. 
If you don't do that, you fail. That's excellent and very incisive. Um, do you have an ideal reader in mind? And, and who is this person? So my ideal reader is anyone who's the person who's the furth furthest away from who I am. Uh, because I think that's what I'm excited by as a writer, is someone who has no life experience that I have who um, is still connected to my work. Actually, doesn't think a whole lot about me as a person, like is, can take or leave me as a person, but liked the book and has things to say about the book. And a few times, I, I don't know if this has happened in your career, but very few times, again, because writers aren't famous, um, you know, I've had people, I've had an email from Italy, I've had an email from a young woman growing up in England uh, who lives in sort of, you know, the, the African England, suburbs of England, and, I, and something like, You've, this book changed my life. But that's all, she just wanted to tell me this book changed her life. She didn't really want to get to know me as a person, and I think that is my ideal audience, is someone who's connected with the art, that it has some transformative impact and their lives don't look like mine, their identity doesn't look like mine. Uh, do you think about an ideal reader, Zuni, when you're writing? Um, actually, not, not at all. <laughs> I, I, just, I just tell the story and I guess my ideal reader would be somebody who wants to read the story for the right reasons. Who really and what, what are those right reasons? Just, I guess, a really not necessarily wanting to know just on the, on the superficial level about where the story goes, but on a deeper level, what is the story trying to say? I guess somebody who's really listening for that would be my, my ideal reader. But again, like I said, I really haven't thought about it. It's still weird to me that I have readers at all. I mean, she, she said, I don't know if this happened in your career, and I was like, oh, my career, okay. <laughs> You've got a career. You've got two novels out. You have a career. So uh, grown up. But, but you are adept at writing in various forms. Your collection, The Island of the Day Before, it comprises poems and fables and short stories. Uh, what, what is the form that you enjoy the most? And, and that's sort of distilling to, uh, a large idea to a very short uh, piece of writing uh, excite you or, or does that scare you? I guess I, I think that it's a tough question because I think each story has a different genre and a different form that it just should be in. So I think it's just in my mind, whatever I think will best tell the story becomes my favorite in that moment. But I think right now I'm definitely leaning more towards prose. Mm. Um, but when I was younger, I, I just, I love to write poetry. So I think, it, I think it does change, but I think again, it depends on what kind of story I want to tell. And I think it's, it's very changeable, my favorite in that sense. And do you also sort of flip from one to the other for the same idea? As in, do you try writing something in, in poetry and then, and then try rewriting that in prose? Not really, because whenever I begin writing something, I already kind of know what form it's going to be in, and then that doesn't really change, because that's just, like, it, the idea just came into existence already in that form. Okay. So I, I, not, I don't normally really switch in, in between very much. Sometimes I combine two forms. Like, I, I write, you know, a short story that's like a paragraph long and has suspiciously sort of rhyming lines. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it changes a lot, but I don't think that I switch from one to the other once the piece is written. Okay. Uh, both of you come from relative privilege in terms of class and education <coughs> and the rest of it. Do you think that this sort of makes it more difficult for you to get at stories of grit, of a, uh, of a more sort of a, a general reality out there, or... Uh, do you think that it sort of helps you stay away from it but still be able to observe and, and, and recount? I think, um, absolutely. I think it's something that um, I grapple with every day in how I think about things. I think part of writing is um, exploring the own bounds of your own empathy. And empathy is different from sympathy, right? Because empathy is trying to understand the mind of someone who does not have the life you have. Um, so I think that's actually, not that I thought of it consciously, but I think part of, a lot of my writing is fueled by that, is trying to understand what that feels like. Um, and I think what's so interesting is um, listening, and, and some other authors said this in the festival, you know, meet different people and really listen to what they are saying to you. Um, because you never, because sh that shapes your reality. That's reality telling you what 
their lives are like because they're speaking to you. And I think you have to base some kernels around truths you know. Um, so in a lot of my characters, you know, are, like you said, in class structures that I've not, I'm not in. Mm. Um, but part of what's informed me is, you know, growing up in apartheid, uh, growing up post-apartheid South Africa, but even growing up in India, um, you already are in this very interesting um, ecosystem across class. In your home, there's your family of relative privilege or not. There is your friends who all vary in classes and races and ethnicity and religion. And then there's someone who's either helping out in the house or helping out in the garden. And in my book, um, I explore that. And I didn't know I was going to write about it because that relationship is so intimate. It's such an intimate relationship, but it is so complex. And I was saying the other day at lunch was, I, you know, you never know what's going to be in fuel your writing, but I remember countless afternoons as a teenager sitting at my desk doing some God knows what crap, you know, what teenagers do, not always homework, and uh, the helper in a house, Melanie, would be coming in and cleaning up my disaster of a room. And I would be sitting there at my desk feeling only slightly uncomfortable by the fact that I was sitting on my desk doing nothing of value while she's coming in, a grown, educated woman cleaning up the mess I made. But it was only slightly frustrating, slightly uncomfortable. And I would wonder all those teenage afternoons, what am I doing with my life? Will I become anything? But now I see those teenage afternoons very differently because why was I just sitting there? There must have been something better I could have done than sit there uh, if I felt uncomfortable about it. But that tension, that slight tension, is reality. That is bridging that class divide every day. Um, and I, I got to know Melanie very well, and we talk so much, and I go back to the things, kind of things she would say to me, and I, and I carry that guilt, as everyone will or should, um, but do something with that guilt, I guess. Zudi, you, your work is a cornucopia of characters. You've, you've created so many characters in, in, in each of the sort of pieces that you write. What, what is the grain how, of, of your character? I mean, where does that start? Well, I think it's kind of important to keep in mind that every character will have a different story to tell you, but that that won't always necessarily be one that is very sort of dynamic. Mm. Like, I think that each person will have a different story to tell no matter how, in, even in regards to the previous question, that no matter how they grew up, they will have something to tell you. Because I feel like you could put a character in a cave for his whole life and he'll still have things to tell you about that cave that you would never have known otherwise. So I think that's kind of where I start with each character. Like, what story do they, does this character in particular have to tell me? And then I kind of work outwards. And I guess it's, I'm, however, the worst at coming up with names for them. <laughs> Which is why I almost get frustrated when I come up with a new character because I'm like, great, now I don't know what so to call So who names your characters? I do, but sometimes I have to use like the dumbest. I'm just like, okay, my classmate in like second grade, what was you the dog's name? Can you give us an contest. example? Give us an example. Um, okay, so there were some horses in my book, The House That Spoke, and I had no idea what to name them. So then my dad told me the names of horses that he knew in Kashmir when he was young, and I was like, that's brilliant, I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you don't even want to think about it for a little bit? I was like, nope, it's great, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, I can't think of anything else. And that's why I so envy, like, when I was younger, I read the, when I was reading and falling in love with the Harry Potter books, I was like, oh my gosh, these are such awesome names. And I was like, when I grow up, I'm going to make equally cool names. But I can't, I have no idea how. I'm like the worst at it. Have you thought about running Instagram contests to name your characters? That's a good, I should do that now. But I just, I don't know. I have a feeling everyone's going to be like, isn't that like your job? <laughs> No, I mean, the smart way is to make other people do your job. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, Arushi, a lot of your characters have a very troubled or a kind of troubled relationship with their parents. Um, I want to ask um, uh, you first and then uh, Zuni, uh, whether that is still fundamental to the teenage experience, this dissonance with, uh, with parents, this um, uh, sort of constant complaint that uh, they don't understand you. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, when I was growing up and reading all these books, whenever teenagers did something interesting, there was always this issue with their parents. Either parents were not there or the parents were awful. So maybe that seeped into my consciousness. I was like, my, my characters can't do anything interesting unless there's something going on with the parents. So maybe that was in the subconscious. But I think consciously, um, 
Parents represent, in some ways, the status quo. They don't mean to, but they're the people who are surviving and trying to get their kids to freaking survive in very difficult situations. So they represent the status quo. They have something to lose. They have something to lose. And I think the tension in my book is these teenagers often, um, the tension arises from that, is that these teenagers look at their parents, they see their parents as the status quo, and they don't have the same sense of what they have to lose. And that's where the tension actually starts. Uh, Zuni, how do you deal with parental discord in your work? And, and how does your relationship with your own parents sort of influence that? Um, well, my mom's in the audience, and she's the best, guys. <laughs> um, no, I think that I've actually... This that is, being said. Yeah, that being said. Um, that being said, um, I guess it's not... It's just about, like, difference in... I mean, I, I guess we've always kind of had it, even as kids. Like, when I was younger and I didn't agree with them about something, I'd be like, I'm running away. And they're like, where to? And I'd just be like, I don't know, but somewhere, like Nani's house or something. So, like, I guess that, that kind of sense of, like, wanting to be independent is always there. And I think that's kind of the fundamental area of tension for me. But I guess I've been relatively lucky in the fact that I'm actually pretty happy with my parents. Like, that, and I always, even in, like, middle school, I remember, like, all the other girls would be like, oh, my gosh, like, my mom made me do this. And I was like, yeah, like, they're the worst. But, like, I didn't, I had no idea. So, like, and I guess I've been quite lucky because both my parents are so different. And I guess that's good because I can go to one or the other for like very different things. Like even through the whole college application process. Um, like when like when I was like, oh my gosh, like I I want I wanna have the ambition to get into here. here. My mom was like, yeah, just do it. Like it's gonna be such an amazing resource for you and this, that, the other, and you know, you really need to get good grades. And then I'm go to my dad and he would he would be like, you can drop out now, it's fine. <laughs> Like, fully, you'd be like, I don't understand why you need to be studying physics if you're going to be a writer. Like, he just de he doesn't understand why I would need to have a degree at all. So it's good to have, like, that kind of difference. So I think I've been very lucky in that sense. Uh, do your characters also sort of share a, a lovely, warm, cordial, supportive relationship with their parents all the time? Yeah, mostly, because I feel like if I tried to make it any different, I would just completely fall into stereotypes because I don't really know. So I guess, you know, right now, of course, empathy is such an important part of it, but I just genuinely feel like at this stage, if I tried to write about a rebellious teenager, it would just be really cringy and the worst because I have no idea what that's like. I'm like the least rebellious person on the planet. Like, I feel nervous asking the teacher if I can go to the bathroom because she's in the middle of a lecture. Um, you were both born in a, a globalized world and, and grew up like others in your generation in a more sort of cosmopolitan world. Um, what then are your views on cultural appropriation? And Arushi, I want to uh, ask you this question particularly because um, you are writing about the challenges of uh, people that's different from uh, yourself. Did you worry that, uh, uh, that you will be accused of A, appropriation, and B, whether you will be able to get the nuances right because you're writing from the outside in, in, in many ways? Every moment. Every moment I worry about that. So when I started, when I was doing it, it's been really interesting attending this festival because I've heard such different opinions. And they tend to be on kind of either side. So there's an opinion of apps, like you should not even attempt it. And then there's this opinion of there's no such thing. And I think those are both problematic opinions. Um, and, and, and every panel I go to, every I, I get asked this question, and I think it's treading carefully. Um, the point of bringing up this big bucket of cultural appropriation is not to use a big series of words and impress people at conferences. It's to say to you, be careful, think about what you're doing before you just do it. Because often I meet wonderful writers, they, they're great, um, and they're my friends, and they're like, oh, I'm writing this Native American thing, and I'm like, oh, do you, do you know anyone? Do you? And, and no, no, oh. Okay, I don't want to throw cultural appropriation at them, but I just say very gently, I'm like, um, John, um, maybe, maybe you might want to um, talk to one person. Um, so I think it's, for me, the way to navigate that is, is twofold. One is starting from what you know, don't start from what you don't know, and, and tread carefully. 
and, and, and be very open to criticism. So I actually, just because you printed a novel doesn't make it perfect. Um, and I'm very open to being corrected and questioned and, 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 and adapted because here's the thing, I'm not going to have an ego of a 60 year old writer. I'm saying I'm new to this, tell me what is wrong, write an even better book than I've written. Um, and I was lucky enough, you know, I went back to South Africa for my tour and, and um, even in the US, um, the Black Historical University issues an award every year for the book that most um, authentically captures African black experience. And I did win that award and I was just so taken aback because I, I was worried about appropriating, but I was lucky enough and honored enough to be recognized. Um, and having, you know, young black women come to me and say, you know what? you actually did it. And they say it that way. They don't say like, you're so great. They're like, you actually did fine. And it's not that everyone feels that way, but having some validation, it's important. It's not irrelevant. Um, I want both of you to tell us a little bit about the millennial mind. Uh, a, because you are millennials yourself, and B, because uh, that's the audience you're writing for primarily. Um, what are they curious about? What, what intrigues them? And by them, I mean you. Um, and and what, what fascinates you? And what about the world sort of angers uh, both yourself and your readers in your view? Zuni, you want to go first? Um, well, I'm not sure is the honest answer. I guess what angers us, I was, I was saying yesterday as well, that we kind of have a complete... Um, like a lack of tolerance for discrimination, which I think is a really great thing that now generations are sort of growing up with, which we don't even like entertain arguments about why discrimination is okay. Like they're like, well, if you think about the fact and we're just like, no, you're, you're just wrong. You just are. Like, so I think that's a really great thing. And I guess what angers us is there's a real sense of wanting to go out there and make your life your own, which I suppose is in all teenagers, but I think in our generation it's particularly strong because we, there's, a, there's, a really, there's a sense of awareness about what's going on with the world and a real will to change it, even at a very young age, which I think is a really great thing about this generation particularly. Arushi, what do you think? I, I agree with both of those things, and I think, um, I think the issue is, you know, people who are more established and then kind of further along, they say, oh, there's a lot of polarization, and, and why, are, you know, why are you being intolerant yeah. of having yeah, a conversation? Yeah. And they always say that and say, oh, young people are always throwing Me Too and mansplain and all these words out without thinking about them. And some cases that is happening. Um, but here's the thing. I'm happy, I'm at a festival, I am happy to talk to someone who doesn't believe in climate change. I'm happy to sit down and have a cup of tea and talk about climate change. But that person right now is not going to paralyze me from acting from what I'm like 100% sure is a truth. Um, I'm happy to have a civil conversation, but time is running out on certain issues. There are lives on the line on a lot of these issues. It's not about this polite, you know, they, they accuse a lot of millennials that, oh, if you say the wrong word, you know, you're excommunicated. No, it's when there are lives on the line and there's a there's a feeling that no one is doing anything about that, which once, now, like I'm a little bit older, so I've now started working in government and other things. Sometimes no one is doing anything about it. So I've actually been on leadership level where no one is recognizing there's an issue. Then I'm going to be a bit abrupt and I'm going to be a bit pushy and I'm going to be a bit polar polarizing because climate change should not be something we're debating about. We should be doing something about it. I'll happily debate it with you for 30 minutes, but I'm not going to like, listen to you as my primary source on which to act upon. Sorry, but no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As a lot of people uh, who attend festivals um, uh, are curious about, uh, take us through your journey of sort of starting the book to how you got published and, and what that process was like for you because I'm sure a lot of young people uh, sitting here today want to know how can they write their own book and get it out there. Oh, um, well, mine was actually, I knew that I wanted to write a novel, but only once I knew that, only once I felt that it was actually good enough to send to publishers did I do it. So I think that it's important to be sure of what you send before you send it, because if you know there's something wrong before you've even sent it, then you can't even be confident about what you've sent. But I also think that it's not, I mean, you don't necessarily have to be published right away. I mean, some of my friends have really amazing online blogs, or they get published in literary magazines, which is, you know, a really incredible 
step to have taken. So I think that it's also this, you know, you shouldn't think that if you don't get published, then it's worthless because that's not true either. So, and what I did was I sent three different publishers um, the first three chapters of the novel and a skeleton for what I wanted the entire book to look like. And I asked them if, all, uh, if I could meet them at the Jaipur Literature Festival. And the first publisher was like, that's interesting, contact us when you've written the next three chapters, which basically, I mean, no. <laughs> um, yeah, just, you're, no. I love those basic no's, like, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah. they don't say it. Yeah, like, just it's say like, no. just tell me once you've written the next three chapters. And, and I'm like, they smile like this, like, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do. And yeah. it's like, I, I don't think you heard what I said, but that's okay. That's nice. Yeah, that <laughs> sounds lovely, but no. A little child. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. So that was the first, the second publisher asked, she was lovely, she asked a lot of questions, but she didn't actually get to whether it was going to be like a thing. <laughs> like she just didn't say, she was like, that sounds really great. And what about this? And what about this? And she was like, okay, great. Well, it was nice meeting you. And I was like, okay, bye. Um, but the third publisher who was Penguin actually said that they would love to publish it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And I really didn't expect that. I mean, I expected at most, you know, interest enough to ask me to send more chapters or something, you know, earlier than in the next six months. But they, but they just said they would publish it. And I still remember that it was on um, the lawn and there was a hallway like that. And I walked like that and I was like, just look normal, just look cool, just look professional. And then the moment I turned, I was like, oh my God. And I just ran down the rest of the corridor. So that was a really amazing moment. But I think, yeah, I think also um, you should send it out to as many publishers as you can because I mean, it can't hurt, right? Uh, so you, had you written your whole book before you uh, spoke with Penguin? No, no I hadn't the because I, I'd written three chapters on the novel Skeleton and I was working on other parts of the book, but I didn't expect them to, you know, ask to, to say they would publish it so soon and they were like, maybe we can publish it at next year's Jeopardy Literature Festival. So first I ran on, ran on the court and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, they're publishing it. And then I realized how much work I was going to have to do in order to get it published by the next Jeopardy Literature Festival and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what so have you it, done? Yeah, I was like, oh my God, was this a mistake? Like, and that's when it really hit me how much work I was going to have to do to get off. And I'd never written anything longer than a short story before that. And I was like, so they want me to write a whole novel in time for next year's Jeopardy Literature Festival. And then I was like, wait, no, 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 not in time. Be to be published in time, which means I'm going to have to give it an <coughs> even sooner, which, could, which means amazing. it's going to need like three months to send it to print, which means that I'm going to have to spend my entire summer vacation on a book. <laughs> and I was like, oh God. This but is you got it done. I did. And it was really, that summer was really rough <laughs> because every morning I, I had this great plan in my head. I was like, of course, ever the idealist. I was like, what I'll do is I'll wake up before the whole rest of the family and I'll spend three or four hours writing and then everyone else will wake up and then it'll be like, you know, I was never even doing it because I'll just be sacrificing on sleep, which of course it didn't work that way because 80% of the time I needed longer than that and I was still sitting in that room long after everybody had woken up and gone down and had pancakes for breakfast and playing video games and I was just in that room and I think the worst part was that I picked the room to write. It was so, such a silly decision that looked out onto the pool so I was sitting in there writing and I heard like all four of my cousin brothers in the pool and I just looked over and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not a smart decision. In the future, I would not do that ever. <laughs> that's, that sounds like the roughest part. But it was still, a, that's a dream story. <laughs> like exactly. only three publishers. Mm -hmm. Like that's I started writing at 16. Yeah, that's an amazing story. So yeah. I started writing when I was six, I finished my first manuscript when I was 16. There's a reason it hasn't seen the light of day. There's a reason. But uh, I sent it, I was in South Africa at the time, and I sent like 15, I just sent packages across the oceans to random people in the US, and I got form rejections. And I, every two to three years, I'd submit different terrible novels. Um, so I wrote for actually, people say, oh, you know, you're so young. And you probably, I was like, I've been doing this for like a decade, <laughs> and getting rejected for most of it. So a decade is a decent time. Um, and I think, the lessons I would say is, unfortunately, publishing is um, a bit of an elitist industry. So it really does matter who you know. Um, and you should totally keep submitting. Because what happens when you keep submitting at a young age, m the differentiator between me and someone else when I you know, started actually getting published was I was very thick-skinned. And they'd be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I got rejected. I got terrible form rejections when I was 16. This is nothing. And I still approach rejection that way because I got rejected a lot very young. And that's the big piece of advice I'd give to anyone is spend 10 years getting rejected <laughs> and start now. I always say when I go to high school is like achieve your peak suckiness now, not later. 
because that's the differentiator. Okay, I'm going to uh, quickly ask the two of you who you like to read so that we can all sort of add to our list. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> we have time for two quick readings and then we'll take the uh, audience questions. So who do you like to read? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, well, I guess it kind of depends. Um, Neil Gaiman, I love Neil Gaiman, and he was supposed to come but for the... Yeah, he days. didn't come, and it, I really can't even tell you how much that broke my heart, but he, a few months ago, he followed me on Instagram, and it was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me in my life, and I've never met him, and Has he's... he comment? No, he's never spoken a word to me, but the fact that he hit follow, and then I put, right after he followed me, I put this post about Coraline, which is my favorite book of his, and I was like, this is the best book ever written, and he liked it. And I was like, awesome. this is, I've just, you know, I should just send, this should be my whole university application. Is that just, you know, you don't need to know my SAT scores, you just need to know that Neil Gaiman not only followed me, but liked the post of mine. <laughs> liked the post <laughs> praising <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, still, he still, still liked counts. it. That's a lot of energy that it takes to tap that twice, sure. and he spent it for my post, and it's, I was dying. Um, but so Neil Gaiman, I love Neil Gaiman. I, Love um, T.S. Eliot. My entire extended essay was on him, and it took it was four thousand words, and it took me a whole semester. And I liked him a little less then, but still, <laughs> T.S. Eliot. I love um, Ernest Hemingway, and yeah, those are some of the writers that I that I really liked. I think also we should just simplify the Booker process by whoever Neil Gaiman liked. Mm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but just to be clear, neither Hemingway nor Eliot follow me on Instagram. That hasn't <laughs> happened yet. Uh, so I started off um, because I was brought up by Indian parents and lived in India. It was like start off with like Enid Blyton and oh Agatha gosh, yes, Christie. And yes. Like I was brought up on that. That is important. That's an important milestone in my life. And the other day I had to go on a panel about decolonization of children's literature. And I was like, I was a colonized subject. Um, and, and, you know, owning up to that. And, ooh, this is getting violent. Oh, my gosh. Um, I think they don't really like Agatha no. Christie. Uh, they, they, they're telling me to not be colonized. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a good thing not to be colonized. Um, but though that informs you, and I think now, I think some of the books that I really enjoyed, um, there's a wonderful Canadian author called Erin Bow, uh, and she wrote something called Scorpion Rules, and it's just such an interesting book um, about now, and it's young adult, and it just, it stayed with me a long time, so I recommend that. I love Philip Pullman, um, and I, I, I like a lot of African writers. I, lo I love Zeke Sumdar. Um, and so I, I read kind of across fantasy to like, uh, you know, to crime fi fiction. And I, I do, I used to hate it when like old fogies would tell me read a lot to be a writer, but I just read basically everything, like basically everything. Yeah, but I would also say that one important tip is that not to be afraid to abandon a book if it's terrible. <laughs> because when I was younger, I had this sense <laughs> of like, like it's wrong, you know, like I, like, okay, I know a lot of people are gonna hate me for saying this, but I really just didn't like the Divergent series. And I started the first book and I was like, I felt a duty. I was like, I have to read it till the end because you know, it's so rude. I can't just stop reading it in the middle, but it just takes, there's just, it just takes so much out of your life. And there's just so many good books out there to read that I would say if a book is really bad, like just drop it. I mean, it's not, it's not worth it. You know, you're wise to have come to that early. I've come to that decision, but much later <laughs> in life. All right, so we'll have a, a quick reading. Arshi, you want to go first? And sure. uh, then we'll throw it open. Um, so just very brief context. Um, as you know, I mentioned, four points of views in the 70s. Um, what I'm going to read uh, from Zanela's point of view. So she is 17, uh, brought up in the township, a student, and as you know, a very bad singer. And this is in the morning of the uprising, Soweto uprising. When we came to the bridge... We started tripping over each other. The placards ahead of me stopped, even though this was not a stop that we had planned, even though there didn't seem to be any cars blocking our way. A hiss went through the crowd, which became a word that traveled down to me, police. I lost Vusi as he ran ahead to find out, find out if it was true I never saw him again. Up ahead, Marcy climbed up on the back of a truck. We're not going to fight them, he said. Be calm, police. Minutes passed and they didn't come. We started pushing each other, trying to go forward. Winston, the boy from the lady, shouted, Where's your police, huh, Marcy? A laugh went through the crowd. 
Then we heard the sirens, the sound of rubber scraping road, three vans and four police cars. They formed into a line. The policemen in khaki got out with their dogs. The dogs, like their handlers, formed still shadows in the afternoon light. It was their thick bodies, their dogs and their cars between Orlando Stadium and us. I elbowed students to get to the front, crushing placards under my feet. We came closer and closer to them. Stand back! A policeman shouted through a loudspeaker. He was middle-aged with thick lines under his eyes and near his mouth. He tried it again in Zulu. Kathle! Then added that he was serious. I laughed at his attempt at Zulu. Some of the kids behind me started laughing too. The dogs strained on their leashes. Still, we came closer. The line of policemen looked like it was going to break. A policeman with a child's face and a thin red beard stood opposite me, his fingers adjusting and readjusting on his gun. In a few seconds, I would be at his throat. Then, one of them threw something into the crowd, tossing it high above my head. Tear gas. Still, we came at them. A, do a dog came loose from a leash and charged at us. Someone took a rock and threw it at the dog, and then others did too. That's... That's when the policeman with the red beard decided to shoot. Someone shouted and then we were all shouting. We found stones near our feet and threw them more shots. We scattered far and wide into side streets, slamming into shop fronts. As I ran, I found small hands and so I dragged the kids with me into an opening between two shops. I pressed their heads into the ground as more shots rang out. Students kept throwing stones. Stop throwing, I screamed, stop throwing. My voice was gone, broken. A boy fell in front of me. Someone picked him up. Still the shots came. The boy was picked up by his friend. His blood fell onto the ground. A girl ran next to him, crying. The children watched me with their large eyes. I had not expected them to shoot us. I did not. The violence took me back to the first days of drawing up plans with Billy, plans to bomb the tower, back through all that had happened to this moment. I gripped the children's small bodies closer to me, the smoke, the sweat, and the acrid taste of tear grass in my throat. Okay, I don't know how I'm, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that, frankly, you but follow okay. That very well. okay. Um, so I'm gonna read from, they, they brought both books, but I'm gonna read from um, the one that just was just released in August, The Island of the Day Before which was a collection of short stories and poems based on the modern fairy tale. And I'm going to read a part from the story that it was named after. So, okay, it's on page 137, so I'm going to... Yeah, oh, no. no, I got it, I got it, okay. All right, I got it. <laughs> okay. It had been 12 days since the town of Emerest had last seen a ship. The storm was brewing silently around the island refusing to make a choice about whether to stay or to leave. So there it sulked, milling about like the out-of-work fisherman, shuffling its feet into the ocean and making the waves wreck, wreck the tattered shore. No boats could be seen about the sun-dusted horizon, and the sea seemed to take offense at this, making itself known with the deepest of thundering in the gloomy evening. The people became as the weather, dragging themselves along with little to do and little to say, at a loss even to comment on the unchanging sky. The water, after all, was the true heart of the island. The water was the spirit of the people. The water was their bread and circus. The water was what ran beneath their homes. Without it, their town became a dry rock, moon craters revealing themselves against chalky sand. Several townspeople had, in fact, returned to the water once their time on land was done. And this was another popular story around the sheltered, fiery homes, the mermaids of Emerest. They were so rare, so deadly, so horrific, that to see them was to become them solely through a shattering of the mind. Many a fisherman had lost himself to this siren of the devil. To the town, she was not a saintly, kindly light, but a fang, toxic beast. No one had ever really seen one, but as it often goes with these things, no one really had to. Now, however, in the midst of such dull murkiness, these fables seem to have smudged in the town's memory. 
They would sit at the stewing sand-filled beaches and wait for the sea to come home. That was great. So we'll throw it open for questions. Uh, show of hands, anyone? Is there someone with a mic? There, there at the center. Hello. Yes, a uh, fascinating conversation. Really, really interesting because, you know, A, there is very little um, a fiction for, uh, for teenagers, and then secondly, fiction written by teenagers, so absolutely brilliant. My question to both of you, Arushi and Zuni, is um, teenagers usually shy away from, uh, you know, uh, their thoughts being out there. They like to keep things within themselves. So what were some of the influences when you both started writing initially to say, you know what, I have a lot to say and I'm just going to put it out there and um, you know, just say what I want to and people can like it, not like it, uh, comment on it, but I'm still going to do this. So you know, what was it that really uh, you know, brought you to, I'm going to write a book? Yeah, I think... Um Writing a book is because you find it fun, right? And so it starts with that place where you, you love it so much. But I think the beauty of the book is no one has to see it. No one ever has to see it. I made the mistake of my brother having read my first one. And to this day, there's this one sentence that was really bad that he quotes to me for fun, just to remind me. And it's a really bad sentence. So um, the shame or, or, or the embarrassment of bad writing or, or writing that doesn't resonate, it, it, it's there with you, but it goes back to the second th the thing I said earlier is if you're okay with people making fun of you at an early age, um, I, did, I did something really dorky, I did debate when I was young, and debate you really get roasted at a very young age for everything. Um, so you, you become comfortable with it, and you get a thick skin, and um, you know, I published a bit later than I was 16, but the idea of... Um, being scrutinized wasn't an alien idea. Uh, it was going to happen. Um, and it was something that happened to everyone else. But I, I think that another piece of what you're saying is that the, I, was a very, I was a quieter teenager than I am now. I talk a lot now. But at 13, 14, I was very quiet unto myself because I needed that time to reflect. And I think that's OK. And, and when I go and I talk to parents now, I'm like, let them do their thing. They just need time to have it in their heads. It's not necessarily that they're embarrassed and self-conscious. A little bit of that, but a lot of it is there's a lot happening. There's a lot of stories they're telling themselves. They'll figure it out. They will figure it out. Yeah, I think that's true, but I think it also depends based on the teenager because I think it's important. I think if the story that you have has enough reason for being told, then it, it, it becomes a lot easier. Not easy, but a lot easier to have the confidence to say it. But again, I also think it depends from teenager to teenager because I have always talked a ridiculous amount. Um, so I think that it, it really depends. I was once, we were seven and we were in Bhutan and we had to finish a trek of some ridiculous you know, length. And my parents were worried that I wasn't going to be able to finish it. But I was talking to the guide the entire way. And I was just talking and talking and talking. And I didn't even realize how far we had walked. Because I was just like, so basically what I'm saying is this at like seven. Mm -hmm. And he was like, that's great. OK. Yeah, OK. So that was, I guess it just really depends. And But I, yeah, I do think that having a reason for telling a story definitely helps with confidence. Uh, the young boy there, maybe. So um, as a fellow 17-year-old, you don't know how inspiring and enriching it is to be here today. Um, so I have a question. Um, in this time of standardized testing, college applications, extended essay, CAS, you know, schoolwork, how do you sort of get the time to write even though you really love it? I think what I used to do is I used to wake up early in the morning. So I would wake up at, um, at 6 and I would get in an hour of writing before school. So I would dedicate that time to it. I would be like, this time, no matter what else is happening in life, this time is for writing. And I think it's also important. I mean, I look, I, I love school as much as the next person. But I think it's important to realize that there are things beyond your grades. And I think it's important for every student to have something they're doing that isn't their grades. Because otherwise, it just gets you know crushing. And I think it is important to know that, um, that university, it, it has to be the university that's right for you, not necessarily, you know, just the, the top universities, which, you know, I think that's really important to keep in mind because I think too many people abandon hobbies that they have because to make more time for schoolwork because they think that that's what will help them get into university. But in the end, 
um, when I applied, it was I, I was lucky enough to be accepted into Stanford in their, their early acceptance um, program. And it was me and one other girl got in from my grade, and which has never happened. I mean, they just don't accept two people from one grade. It's just very unlikely. And the only reason that, and that girl, she is absolutely, I mean, I, I know she'll never see this, but hi, Ria, if you are. But so she is an am amazing at math. She gets top marks in everything. Once I called her to be like, hey, do you know how they're calculating the transcripts? Like, do you know what percentages of what they're taking? She's like, oh, well, everything for me is a 4.0, so I haven't actually checked. And I was like, oh, right, completely wrong person to call. So I, all my life at high school, I was like, I mean, she's amazing. I was like, I just wish that I, it was that, you know, I got grades like that, but in the end, the only reason that both of us got in is because I was so different. Is because I f was I like I love writing and I love theater and I love art. That, in in amazingly, if I had had what I wanted to when I was younger and if I had been more like her, I wouldn't have gotten in. So I think that's really important to keep in mind that what makes you different is in the end what will get you in. Excellent. Uh, next question, uh, maybe here. <coughs> So we have five minutes. We'll take three very quick questions. So my question is to you, Arushi. You said empathy is, you know, what you look for because it's the for a reader. Uh, but at the same time, you said that your ideal reader is somebody who is much older, okay, but can relate to what, uh, you know, or comes to you and says, oh, this is from my time, and therefore I like it. But how do you develop this sense of empathy with somebody who's much older to you, comes from a different generation altogether, and then bridge that gap so that, you know, both of you come to a meeting point where, you know, things are in the same space. Yeah, and I, I think it's not even just older. It's the person who's the most removed from my reality is my ideal reader. And I think it goes back to how I like to write in different times is, and this is a technique I use all the time is, and it's a very common known, is start with what would bring you into the same, that's a truth that you both acknowledge. Um, and I think when you start there, then someone's defense is lower because you're not challenging them quite yet until you do. And then they're sort of a frog in a boiling water because they're like, oh, she seems like she won't, you know, she seems like a human, okay. And then they go along and then they start agreeing to things they didn't realize. And I, one of the most beautiful things is finding empathy in people who don't want to be empathetic with you. And, and similarly, when people have done that for me, and I think the technique is to start from a truth that you both can can understand and people are also very very touched and this is about a, a writing but also in meeting and, and, and connecting is people are very touched when you listen you actually listen to them so I have this weird superpower where I can remember things people have said to me 10 years ago and I can remember like conversations verbatim um, and when you show that you just listen to the thing that they said five minutes ago even if you don't agree with it it changes that, that it becomes a more empathetic conversation because what I will say about today's times is I don't know how many people are actually listening <laughs> to each other. You can listen, you don't have to agree. So um, th I think that's how you build emp empathy because then you don't start from a defensive place, you start from a place of connection. But then um, I'm also very blunt and I say, actually I totally don't agree with you. Um, actually, I think that's quite racist. <laughs> and I'll just smile and say it. And saying it in a gentle way also is really helpful yeah. because then they're like, oh, the small Indian lady told me that was racist. <laughs> So we have one minute left. We'll take one last question. Um, uh, the, the bearded gentleman has been. Hello. So I've got um, two very small questions. The, the first one is not, it's not personal to both of you. It's more like the, the young age um, of writers. And, and you know, so uh, as you spoke about Netflix, both of you, um, there's a lot of disturbance in, in literature as well as media right now. So when you are writing, catering to young readers, what like um, so personally? What I think that so the legacy literature, which is there, like in the quality and the, the the what they maintain, is not what the young readers are looking for. Uh, whilst it kind of challenges the entire structure of the legacy literature. So to what extent uh, it could be bended or amended to kind of like you know make it more inclusive and like make it more uh, attractive to to younger readers. And the second question would be uh, what I've seen is a lot of young writers are predominantly young girls and not a not lot of uh, young guys are coming up, probably because of the, uh, again, the gender appropriation. Because, you know, I, I personally, what I've noticed is uh, a young girl could possibly write her minds out these days as opposed to a young boy, because he might not be um, wanting to be, uh, you know, translated as 
someone who's just like being, I don't know, like an, an abrupt young boy who doesn't have the, uh, <laughs> I, I don't have the be best words to put it. But yeah, you, we get it. How, yeah. A, how do you modernize yeah. literature? And B, neither, uh, we don't have a young boy here, so yeah. I think we'll skip that question uh, for the paucity of time. You wanna go? Well, I think it's just important to tell stories, to allow every story to be heard in some capacity. I think that's what really my generation is kind of all about, that even if it's a story that perhaps wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be like the stories that came before it, then it's all the more important to tell it. I think that's what I personally would say. Yeah, and I think the, um, what I'll add to that is one thing that's very prominent of, of, of literature now for young people is this, everyone says, there's too much dialogue in young people's work. Uh, well, yeah, but also I think the way my training in dialogue for where I'm at as a writer is relatively better than some other people because dialogue is a legitimate thing to write. So I'm happy to write dialogues because dialogues are fascinating because things are unsaid and said and things are said in a weird way. Briefly touching on the men thing, I think men are, need to participate more in literature. Agreed. Just go for it. Like, yep. I actually think that's a problem because I go into rooms and then young, you know, a young man says, why aren't we reading books like yours? And he told me, please don't put a woman at the front of your cover because your book is not about just women only reading it. I said, yeah, it isn't. Um, so I think women, men just need to participate and, again, listen. Just participate. And first start listening and then participate. We want young men to participate. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And hopefully next year we'll do this panel with two young men. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. What a wonderful session, we that are young. Please join me again in giving a massive round of applause to Arushi Raina, Zuni Chopra, in conversation with Veena Venugopal. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. If you have any questions for our wonderful panelists, they're going to be going out to the book signing desk outside. Please allow them to get to the desk because we need to get the next session in. But thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah, your bags are just down here. Yeah.